Well, the Boroff stuff interests me. Um, we'll speak about this now. Sure. Because you got some pretty big names. I was like looking at the list of people you had wearing your merch. It was Paul McCartney, Richard Branson, Kate Moss, Ricky Gervais, who I absolutely love. And then yeah. you said there was much more as well. Yeah. I remember this was a good few years back, weren't it? It was, yeah. it was all over socials. I remember saying, I was thinking, how, how's Lee getting all these people to, <laughs> to wear his merch? So yeah. that was pretty impressive. I mean, Boroff, it had a good cause behind it, right? Yeah, it did. Yeah, basically. Um, like the idea just come from like, uh, I wanted to get involved in sort of products because I'd been in service providing like all my life, you know, being a chef and then having a catering company and then a cleaning company at the same time. I was like... I would like something a bit easier. So um, I thought of this phrase, bore off. Well, actually I seen a post on um, Facebook and somebody was writing some boring stuff. I was like, I wish there was a bore off button on here. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's a quite a good phrase. So uh, I sort of had a look to see if it had been trademarked and it hadn't known nothing about the trademark industry, but I knew that was quite important if you wanted to sort of like use a word, uh, like on t-shirts or, or whatever. So, um, so yeah, from there then spawned this idea of having a product with the name Boroff on it. And then a good friend of mine who worked for the BBC, um, she sort of helped me with sort of doing a few sort of uh, interviews, talking about the Boroff itself. And um, we both sort of come up with the idea of what we could do with it and how we could use the phrase uh, in a good way. Because I'd kind of wanted to have the phrase out there selling and obviously what everyone wants to do is make money from it. But equally, it would be good to have a good cause with it too. So I actually, sadly lost my mum to cancer in 2004. So, um, and Macmillan at the time were fantastic. So I got in touch with a PR company in London and they helped me put together this sort of um, campaign for bore off cancer. So uh, initially, they were sort of doing all of the legwork to try and help get celebrities on board. And that just wasn't happening at all. Like I was giving them quite a lot of money and I felt like I was kind of sort of being bluffed and blagged a little bit by them. And I did get warns about this if you deal with PR companies that they can take your money but not do a lot for it. So I quickly found that they wasn't doing a lot. So then I come across this um, database called The Handbook which basically gives you access to every celebrity's agent across the globe. So I thought, right, I'll do this myself. So um, so there I was running my catering company and my cleaning company at the time. And in the evenings, I just started creating these emails to talk about the Boroff brand and linking up with the likes of Macmillan, blah, blah, blah. And so much money is going to go towards Macmillan, so much money would be for bore off itself so like we were do donating i think a couple of pounds per t-shirt to macmillan so i got loads of no's no one was interested people were coming back to me like the agents were quite sort of snooty and so on and so forth and then um this one day i guess the uh so this was going on for weeks actually and then i was kind of realizing you're going to be a bit pushy with these agents because I was kind of being a bit like, oh, you know, I'm sort of being told off by them and they're sort of being a bit rude. And then this one day, I seen a bit of an opening with Kate Moss's agent. And she was like, oh, well, Kate's on site on tomorrow doing a shoot. Send me one out. I might be able to do something. So I phones up the next day. And I was like, right, T-shirts should be with you. I've checked it, tracked it. I goes, just get her to wear this T-shirt, please. And uh, anyway, next time I get this image through from Kate Moss and Stella McCartney holding the t-shirt, the Boroff t-shirt. And it was so iconic. And um, she goes, there you go, got it for you. So then I used that picture and sent it back to all of these agents. And all of a sudden I got, yes, 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 mm -hmm. yes, yes. And then the momentum built. Um, and I was part of the Virgin startup scheme at the time because I went for a Virgin startup loan. And to also have... Um, Virgin sort of on your side as well to sort of help you through. They'd give you a mentor and so on and so mm. forth, which proved to be pretty decent. And um, all of a sudden, Richard Branson then tweets, Facebooks about bore off. Then Sam Branson wears the T-shirt. Then um, Paul McCartney wears the T-shirt. 
Ricky Gervais wears the T-shirt. Kate Winslet's agent gets in touch with me and says, would you do a shoot with Hello Magazine with Kate? We can interview you and talk all about Boroff. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, it was like a real personal interview. That didn't come off in the end, unfortunately. You get a lot of that where it's just almost then. It doesn't happen. Rihanna was doing a concert at the Rico. Her agent says, you can get us the T-shirt like now. We can get it done. We just missed the deadline by like a few hours. She was going to wear the T-shirt on stage. So it was really building up momentum. Um, but it wasn't bringing in any extra sales. It was bringing a lot of awareness to the brand, which was great, which is what I wanted. Okay, Sorry, Lee. <laughs> Bless you. <her. laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Heidi. Um, so, but it was creating a big stir, you know, and there was a lot of people getting in touch. Then I was getting people getting in touch with me about investing in the company and so on. And yeah, so it was, it was, it was doing quite well. And I was only putting a couple of hours a day into it at this point because I had all my other stuff ongoing activities with my businesses and and general life so um but then i started to notice my businesses were starting to suffer a little bit because they were quite sort of big for what they were and it was me and a small team and i was kind of like the the hub of the business if you like and i was the one that kind of sort of did everything so i started to notice things were getting affected slightly so i sort of took my gas the foot off the gas off bore off a little bit and then I was running out of ideas of what to do and lost the energy behind it a little bit and didn't really do a lot with it after that. Sort of just put it on the back burner. Kept all the trademarks. I've always renewed those and kept the domains. Always kept those for probably something to do later on in life because it's proved to be quite a powerful, positive mm. um, product, really, and definitely can do a lot good with it. Um but right now, currently, not at that stage to do that. I did have like a six months ago, a real big urge to sort of do it again. But I'm heavily involved in working on another project at the moment, which is doing really well. So um, my wife's a bit like dubious and she's like, well, you know how much time it's going to take and are you going to get the return and so on. So I've got to weigh all that up at the moment. Well, that's, that's the thing with entrepreneurs though, Lee, isn't it? Their, their mind just goes crazy. Mm -hmm. There's so much you can do, man. I can I can hear it in your uh, yeah. You can, yeah. But, but isn't it incredible? Like how, one hour business starts just from you yeah. sitting there and just an idea pops into your head. Totally. And then two hours a day, like one, it depends what you do in those two hours because mm -hmm. you can piss away two hours quite easily. Oh, easy. Or yeah. you can make that two hours count. So. Yeah. When you think what you achieve with just two hours a day, it makes it even more remarkable, really. Yeah. You've got all these celebrities and kind of like, you know, wearing the brand that you, that you created. It's, yeah. I love sharing stories like this because it does show you with a bit of hustle, a bit of grind. But you're a thinker, clearly, and then mm -hmm. you act upon those thoughts, don't you? I think yeah. a lot of us have those thoughts. Yeah. And then for, for a lot of us, it stops there. Yeah, and I, I've had loads of other thoughts, which I haven't acted on, like the Moonpig idea. I had that three years before Moonpig came out. And I got up one night and I had this burning desire to create basically the same model as Moonpig. But then with my cleaning company that I had at the time, was so busy. I was so stressed. And I didn't know. I built a monster. I didn't know how to control it. But I had these ideas. Like Moonpig, I had, um, had another idea, which again was... Um, so for example, do you know like we have .com, .co.uk? Mm friend of mine who's really big into IT and into all of that, I said to him, what about .eu? None of this had been brought out at this point, none of it. Like no one was doing like European dot, dot .eu, dot .turkey, dot .whatever. None of that was being done. And he's gone, nah, forget about that. <laughs> I could have had all of them. Yeah, you know, I could, there, none of them had even been thought of. So. What I found was when my energy was really high and I was really buzzing and I was just going on instinct and intuition, ideas were flying to mm. me. And, um, I, but I couldn't, I couldn't sustain the energy to do all of them. And what I've learned about myself now is that service providing as much as I've always done it and cleaning with service providing, catering with service providing, too many things can go wrong you rely on too many people, and I'm not very good with that. I'm a little bit of a control freak. Um, I micromanage, not everyone likes that. And I've realized about myself 
I don't really like to have businesses where there's too many key movements and too many people have to be involved. Almost now, I just want to be sort of me and a very, very small team, but still the big ideas, mm. still bring in, you know, the big revenue, the big turnover, etc. but just not um, relying on too many people because I noticed that my, I'm not, you're I'm not a natural entrepreneur some entrepreneurs can have 10 businesses running and go there's an issue there and there's an issue there there's an issue there but I can ignore that I can't ignore them it plays on my mind it does my head in so I end up then killing the energy the flow because I'm worrying and getting angry and getting annoyed at this one or pissed, pissed off with that one so I'm not a natural entrepreneur when it comes to things like that give me one project and I'm fully in control of it and it's a big idea and I'm not relying on too many people it can go I can do really well out of it but too many things going on at once I struggle with that I'm just not mm. I'm just not naturally enough to do that well I think I think you've touched on a wicked point about the energy thing as well so I, I know myself like I'm, I'm a different man with energy versus none like I'm pretty useless when I'm tired and exhausted mm -hmm. I wish I had the ability to kind of like be a little bit better on those days but like the energy thing that you've said some things take some things give yeah so i think knowing yourself quite well is really really important how would you grow this podcast how would i grow it yeah so we, we're 100 episodes in we've had nearly 300,000 eyes on it across all platforms but we want a million eyes on it mm -hmm. how would you grow <laughs> well on the spot. um well i think the thing that you're doing correctly from what i can gather is that you're being consistent um, so consistency is key, like we talked about earlier, sort of just doing one-offs and stuff is, is no good. Um, and getting through the fact that you might be going down a road that takes a long time to build something up. And sometimes, I'm sure you've had times where you're going, oh, I feel like I'm not getting anywhere. And then sometimes you feel like you are getting somewhere and stuff like that. It's a long, slow mm -hmm. process, isn't it? Yep. Um, I've always been a great believer in a stolen idea is a good idea. So if something's working, find, find out what's working, who's doing it, how they're doing it, and just be that little bit better. You listen to any kind of great film director, actor, they've always aspired to be like someone or be better than somebody. So a podcast isn't a new idea, as you know. So you've really just got to aspire to be as good or better than the other ones that are out there. Okay. And um, looking around and seeing what's working for other people, of course, you can probably have your own spin on topics and subjects and the type of people you might want to bring onto the show. But there will be a hook somewhere. I don't know what that is because I've not really explored that. But I would always, any business I've ever done, I've always looked at what the top leaders are doing and always try to be better than those in my industry. I'm not saying like worldwide because I, everything's relevant. So my catering, I looked at everybody locally and what they were doing and how good they were doing it and why they were the best, why the reviews are so good. Why they're, and so I checked everything out and then I kind of just aspired to be as good or better than those. Mm. Um, so that's all I would probably suggest. Yeah, I like that. Because if I go straight to Joe Rogan and go, I want to be better than him, it's mm -hmm. like, it feels like a million yeah. miles away, right? Mm -hmm. So you just go, well, I'm just going to quit now. Because that, that's the thing that jumps into my head. Sure. But you could go, so we're in Mill Street now. My mm -hmm. attitude was, I want the best podcast in Mill Street. That's yeah. my first. Mm -hmm. Then I can go, I want the best uh, podcast in, in Leamington and Warwickshire. Yeah. Then I want the best podcast in my industry. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, you can start chiseling away. I think sometimes if you, uh, if you aim for the pinnacle, you're just totally. not, yeah, you're, not, you're just not there and, and knowing a, yourself has come up a couple of times. You just know you're not at that level. It's a killer of all dreams when you go from like zero energy looking at the highest level. Mm. It's like that gap and you, your mind is programmed to say, yeah, but how? Yeah, but I'm just me. I'm never going to be able to do that. And I was like that in the early days with like my cleaning company. To give you an example... I walked out, I was, a, I was a chef for, since the age of 17, got to executive chef level and uh, decided I just wanted to go into business. And um, I'd had, had some trauma in my life um, around that time. And I just had enough of the red tape of working for companies. And I remember um, being in work 
and I remember somebody coming in and having a trivial problem and she was always whinging and moaning and I was like, why don't you just leave? And she was like, I can't just leave. And I was like, well, you're in here every day moaning. You don't want to be here. I like, just leave, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so, and I said to myself, well, why don't I just leave? So I decided I wanted to run a business. Didn't know what that was going to be. So then I focused on kitchen deep cleaning. I seen some kitchen deep cleaners coming in, cleaning our kitchen. And they made £5,000 in one night. And I'm like, that's good money. And they had like four guys in there. But it was a dirty job. It's hard work. Blah, blah, blah. So I started doing that um, on the side. Um, so it took me ages to kind of sort of work out how to do it, how to get a few contacts and stuff. I hadn't knew if you had a few contacts in the industry. They let me clean a couple of their kitchens, got some of them wrong, got some of them right, as you do. And um, so what I was doing, I was working 60 hours a week, Monday to Friday, excuse me. And then on a Saturday, I would, sorry, on a Friday, once I finished work, I would drive to Wingwire's car park, get changed into a suit, drive and quote a job, and then I would then um, do the job the following week. And I did this for about a year and a half. And nothing was working. Like I had all my energy in my work and I was trying to put all my energy into this new business. And I was like, I've got to make a decision. I felt this pull, this, this just godly pull that said, you've got to leave your job. I was on 35 grand a year. This was 20 something odd years ago, plus That's five impressive. grand a year. Yeah bonus it was really good money really secure job handed in my notice come home and said to Paula who was pregnant at the time of Keen I've handed in my notice I'm gonna take the cleaning full-time and she was like are you mad <laughs> I was like probably but it feels right and I'm I'm gonna I'll make it work and I remember I was sat in my loft which I converted as, into an office and scratching my head and I was going I have no idea how I'm gonna get any business and um I'd handed a business card to a construction company that was refurbing the company I worked for, all of the hotel, all of the hotel, all of the rooms. And uh, he contacted me like a week later saying, would you come in and um, clean marble flooring for us that's in all of the foyers? I was like, no problem. He goes, you've done that before? I went, yeah. <laughs> anyway, straight on to Google, how to clean a marble floor. Spent like the whole day researching it found loads of other companies that clean marble floors, found out what they charge, the whole lot. Next week, turns out, turns up, does the job, charges him two grand, and he was like, that's great. Ended up staying on that job for something like six weeks and ended up walking off with like 30 grand. And I was like, wow, because I'd had all these extra cleaning jobs going on. So I was like, that's my niche, that's my market. I'll go into construction cleaning, lots of recleans, did a bit of research, this is a good industry to go into. So then I, getting back to the original point of being at the very bottom of that sort of ladder and looking at working for these big companies, I was just lucky to work for this first construction firm. You weren't that bothered about the health and safety side of things, the paperwork, etc. I just sort of got in through the back door. So I thought I could do that with the rest. No way. So all of these construction firms I started to contact were just like, well, who are you? How many staff do you employ? What paperwork have you got? Well, I had nothing. And I was like, shit, I've got a lot of work to do to work for these companies. I priced, I think, 80 jobs and lost 80, right? And this went on for pff, like over 12 months. And I was so frustrated because I was like, oh, and I was doing the odd kitchen deep clean, which bringing in a bit of money but nowhere near enough is what I needed. I was like, oh, I've been off more than I can chew here. So I really walked around for quite some time, for some weeks, saying, I'm never going to achieve in this industry. There's loads of companies out there doing it. They've got this, that, and the other. They've got massive teams of people, so on and so forth. And, um, so, and then I woke up one day, I was like, no, I'm going to make this happen. And I'm going to make sure... I am not only am I going to be working for these companies, there was a company at the time called Styles and Wood, who were the largest refit company in the whole of Europe. So they did everyone. They're like John Lewis stores, Morrison's, um, Sainsbury's. They just refitted like all over Europe for all these big companies, uh, retail companies. 
I said, not only am I going to work for Stars and Wood, I'm going to become their key account supplier. I'm going to be the main man for them. So I had then a direction. So I worked hard and hard, really hard to try and work for all of these companies. And then all of a sudden, I got my first job with Boma and Kirkland. Then I got another job with Taylor Wimpy. Then I got another job with Balfour Beatty. Stars and Wood couldn't get any, I, I think I quoted eight jobs for them, lost them all. But I was getting closer each time. And then this one job I did in, uh, quoted in Bedford, I said to Paul, if I don't get this job, I'm not going back to quote for this company. So it was a big Argos store in Bedford, quoted it, didn't get the job. I was like, ah, forget it. I'm not going back to quote for this company anymore. And all the resistance had gone. And then all of a sudden, I gets a phone call at night from Barry, Barry Oakwood, who's the key account surveyor for Stars and Wood. And he said, Lee, we've been watching you a lot. You've been quoting for our jobs. We've got a situation down here where our cleaners walked off site. We were going to pick you, but they've been working with us a long time, but there's an issue. And he says, can you get me 20 people here tomorrow? <laughs> I was like, of course I can. I didn't have 20 people. I think I had about four. So... Well, I got 20 people there the next day and I stayed on this job. And I think the job was quoted, I think I quoted six grand. I walked off the job of 50,000 over a space of two weeks. And I was like, wow. And they all shook my hand and they said, what a great job you've done for us. So then I won another job, won another job, won another job. And I always had this vision in my head of being their main number one supplier. And then this one day, Barry Oakwood said, Lee, can you come in for a meeting with me? He was like the main guy. He was like the key account manager. And I said, yeah, yeah, no, is that everything all right? He went, yeah, absolutely fine. Come in and meet me. And he goes, right, he says, we've been having a chat with internal head office. You were doing such a great job for us. We want you to now be our key account supplier for every job across Europe. He says, so you will get the first choice of every, first refusal of every job that we have in the whole of Europe. I was like, wow. So anyway, so from there, I got 360 Morrison stores. We were doing eight a week. Got the Argos stores, John Lewis stores. And then in the end, we ended up working for the 80 of the top 100 construction firms in the whole of the UK. I think we had at 1.80 staff, 40 were on day rates, 40 were on contracted work. And it was just a monster. And... Um, but my God, it was hard, stressful. You know, it sounded great and it was great. Turnover was there, but at times you weren't making much money. Sometimes you were making a lot of money. But when it evened it all itself out, you wasn't doing as well as you thought you were. And then the recession hit 2008 and bang. We had all our eggs in one basket, all construction. And then all of a sudden, everything just stopped like instantly. And even the QSs and the site managers weren't employing cleaners anymore. They were cleaning themselves just, mm. just so they can keep themselves in the job. And that was a massive wake up call for me because that was my first baby of a business, eight years. And oh my God, I was devastated. It just watched it. I watched eight years disappear in six months. Not a thing I could do about it. But I learned a lot from it and I learned a lot about energy, um, determination, passion, uh, focus, and if I put my mind to anything, I can I can achieve it. So that was my first real lesson in life of you can have whatever you think about with energy. So that for me was a real sort of learning curve. And luckily, I still had my catering company that was sort of ticking over in the background that I would created alongside the cleaning company and um so i basically just put all my energy back into that company mm -hmm. the catering company and uh yeah so then i built that then from practically zero it was doing a few hundred quid a week turnover it when i left the when i left the catering company to focus on the the cleaning company and this is what i mean about not being a proper entrepreneur is that my clean my catering company at the time was doing five thousand pound a week when i but then my, my cleaning company took off so big, I left a couple of people to run it for me. I was so busy. I was up and down the country like seven days a week. I couldn't really keep, 
a close eye on the um, catering company. And then all of a sudden that went down to a few hundred pound a week earnings, you know. So I had to then step back into that and rebuild all of that, which I managed to do. And yeah, we'd become like probably the most successful catering company in Warwickshire then. And um, I kept that running for 17 years. And it was a great company along with Premier Hog Roast. And then the pandemic pandemic come along. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it didn't matter for the first time in all of those years then of being in business, it didn't matter if I come into your office and said to you, have my buffet for 95% off, you wouldn't have had it. No one would have had it because the pandemic just finished everybody like me in my, my industry. And um, I, then I scratched my head a little bit and thought, oh my God, I'm absolutely powerless now. And that taught me another lesson was, you know, um, that you're never really in control of your business uh, or certain businesses because there's a lot of external factors that play a big part in w what the markets do and that can then determine what your business does. So I learned a lot from that as well. How did you keep your head in a strong place during a time where it's government decisions that were affecting livelihoods? Mm. Like, how did you handle that? So um, I've always, I've always sort of looked at the glasses half full. I know it's a bit cliche, but it didn't get me down. What I, um, when it initially happened, I was a bit like, you know, like everyone was a bit bewildered when the pandemic come along and everyone was like starting to see things starting to slow up a little bit, but you couldn't quite work out what was going on. I, I, that was going on for a bit and I was like, oh shit, what am I going to do, you know? And Paula's a panicker, like she was starting to panic, you know? And I was like, no, leave it with me, leave it with me. I'll, let me see what I can do. And um, so I said to my team, listen, we could all go off, be furloughed, do nothing, all the rest of it. I'm not going to get nothing, but you guys will. I said, or I said, I could just create a um, Sunday lunch delivery service and maybe try and do some midweek meals, keep everyone in work and let's just keep the ball rolling and hopefully the pandemic will blow over quite quickly. So anyway, this burning energy come overcome me again just to create um, this new sort of arm to the business, which is called Simply Delivered. So straight away, I was like, in my head, Simply Delivered. Let's have a look to see if I can get one, the domain for Simply Delivered, unlikely. Actually did. I got, there it was, simplydelivered.co.uk. Great, got that. Trademark Simply Delivered, got that got it in Europe, got it in America. So I got the trademark for Simply Delivered. I was like, wow. So I've got it in all of the classifications for like Uber Eats, uh, all of like Uber Eats, Just Eats, that type of thing. This is what I'm like. So I've like gone from like this, like just setting up Sunday lunch dinners to actually Simply Delivered could be really like powerful. It could be like one of the next Uber Eats. So I've like, so I've gone through all this trouble of doing that. And then in the meantime, we've started to do Sunday lunches. So I've created a, a um, bit like a Just Eat kind of platform, Uber Eats platform. Um, and then next minute we're doing 500 Sunday lunches every Sunday, delivering all around Coventry. And then we're doing midweek meals. And the Sundays was really profitable, midweek not so profitable. But the issue I had was I had three units and doing the Sunday lunches was kind of just covering the costs really. Of the of the units and giving a little bit extra in my back pocket, but not a lot. Um, but anyway, I kept it going, and then so that's kind of how I dealt with the pandemic and the situation with my business. It didn't really affect me mentally. I always knew I could do something, and it was just that's kind of, sort of that was where I went. But then a friend of mine, in during the pandemic, he was an athlete like myself. He does the Ironman uh, races very 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 great athlete really just super talented he got diagnosed with bowel cancer in march 2019 just as the pandemic started and then literally a year to the day of him being diagnosed he died of bowel cancer and uh he went through some tra traumatic times with that 12 month process and i got a few more months into what I was doing was simply delivered after that. And again, I just got this 
urge woke up one day to say you're not going back that's it finished so i've woke up one morning i've said to paula i'm done with the catering now i'm not going back and she's like what i said no i'm done that's it it's finished i know i've got this burning desire inside i need to stop doing it um so she goes what are you going to do I said, i'm going to take a year out i'm not doing anything so i took a year out the first six months were great I uh, really enjoyed that. I thought I'll train and I'll do this and do that. And you know, I'm just going to relax a little bit. I felt like I've been grafting since the age of 17. I was now like 45. I felt like I just needed a bit of a break. And then the next six months, I got quite depressed because I wasn't doing as much training as I thought I would. Um, yeah, I just didn't feel very good, to be honest with you. So then um, sort of 12 months on, this opportunity come along to um, start selling products for beauty products in the UK. One of my wife's suppliers wanted to start selling in the UK. So I uh, was like, so he offered her the opportunity to do it. And she was like, no, I wouldn't do it. She says, but my husband might be interested. So I looked at that and then I started to sell for him. And we're doing this sort of like 60, 30, sorry, 70-30 split deal on the products. So I started to sell them. Then he, all of a sudden, he couldn't keep up with my demands of selling the products. And this went on for about three months, and he just couldn't send me enough to sell. So I ended up having to cut him out altogether and then just went direct to the suppliers. And I've been doing that for now for the last two years. So I wouldn't say I'm like one of the largest in the UK for import and export and beauty products but I'm pretty big now with doing that and it's a great business you know I don't do many hours and um, it's more of a lifestyle business really and I don't really rely on anybody um, just myself really um, and no stress <laughs> and I can train now more than I have to work so it's all kind of worked out it's all sort of come full circle and the one thing I said uh, during those 12 months um, cause I'm a big believer in law of attraction as you probably know I said to the universe just bring me an opportunity that allows me to train more than I work and earn more than I've ever earned before and those two things lined up and that's what I'm doing now and mm. everything's worked out really well so um, but now <laughs> because of the way I am I'm now looking for expansion. So we're now thinking about opening up an online pharmacy. My wife's medically trained. She does aesthetics. She wants a training academy. So now we're now going to be building up the wholesale side. I'll be taking care of that. And Paul is looking after the training and the aesthetic side. So it's a real good combination between the two of us. But it's... Um, so I come out of the pandemic probably stronger than what I went into it, if you know what I mean. At the time, it... Did feel a bit crappy, you know, losing my business after 17 years, hard work and not really getting a lot for it at the end of it. And I, you know, I will admit I didn't feel great about it. But what I have learned in life is that whenever there's a change like that, it's usually for the positive. And it's, you can either choose to resist that change or you can embrace that change. And I've always tried to embrace the changes because I know there's always something better on the horizon. That's kind of how the universe will work if you've got the right energy and the right attitude. So that's kind of um, how I try to see everything. And if everything finished tomorrow with what I'm doing, I'm pretty confident it'll be for a better reason. Mm. Yeah, I think I think, I think it affected people in, in different ways for sure, the lockdown. I think for guys like yourself and, and me who quite active imagination. Yeah, we, we'd pounce straight on it. Maybe, I don't know about you, I, I knew myself so well that if I didn't pounce straight on it, mm -hmm. I would easily go down a not very good path. Mm -hmm. So I was like, right, I, I've got to do something Same. too. But I think I think there were, probably for people who aren't as entrepreneurial, I think it might have been a little bit more restrictive. I think if you're self-employed and you've got experience in business and you're a go-getter, it, it had some potential to it. Sure. I think, you know, a single mom of like three kids, very limited on what you can do, where you can go, how many hours you can do. I think things like that might have been quite crippling to be so limited. 
definitely. In, especially in terms of like even your kind of like personal freedom, just just to get exercise. And definitely. Which yeah. They were the things more than anything. It was that that was frustrating for me, like being told about um, how far I could walk. And yeah. Th th that was, uh, and when we go back to kind of what you want in life, I never want I never want to be told that I can't go outside. Totally. That, that was terrifying. Yeah. Because that kind of shit keeps my head in an okay position mm -hmm. you know i understand how to shut the gym stuff like that. i get that but <coughs> the whole limitations around like personal freedoms it's just yeah. fresh air was uh it just mind-blowing man yeah I, I totally agree and um i think a lot of people were too scared to step outside that box mm -hmm. and um for lots of different reasons and i was i remember when the first lockdown happened, and of course I was doing my Simply Delivered stuff, so I was technically allowed to be out and about. And I didn't give a shit. I would have been out and about anyway. Nobody would have kept me in that house. And I made sure I was out and about. And a lot of people didn't, and I get that, why they wouldn't. But um, I was, really shocked the biggest questions i had when it when it the pandemic first come along was why are people rolling over so quickly to this why is there no questions about anything that's gone on i know it's a massive topic and a massive political debate and i don't really do politics but i was really gobsmacked about how easy everyone conforms to those rules and regulations without even asking any real genuine questions that needed to be asked and i was like in my own head was like nobody's keeping me in my house even if i didn't have simply delivered i would have been out of my house regardless and of course i would have been frowned upon i would have probably been grassed up i would you know all of that would have probably went on but i wouldn't give a shit mm. and um and i think i would still be the same now if it come along again i just wouldn't allow that to happen to me I totally disagree about the gyms obviously being closed. None of that should have happened. Um, and lots of other things that shouldn't have happened during the pandemic too. Um, but I d do understand why people wouldn't have done that. I mean, they're under peer pressure working for big corporate organizations. You know, a lot of people are kind of really trapped in the system, trapped in the matrix and they step out of line. You know, they're going to be publicly shamed, mm. which is what most people are worried about, isn't it? Really? Absolutely. I mean, th fear plays a huge role in all our decisions. So I understand. I, I mean, I, I was terrified at first for my mum and dad's safety, and because I didn't mm. know what this was. But after yeah. a short time, you start yeah. to question things. Sure. You start to see it differently. But that was when I was felt really blessed to be uh, a solopreneur or whatever you want to call it, self-employed. Because mm -hmm. I was like, I'm so glad I'm not in that corporate yeah. kind of chain of like, Alex, if you don't get vaxxed, you, you're fired, you're done here. You, yeah. you can say this, you can't say that. Totally. I was like, this is just absolute confirmation that I've done the right thing in, in breaking away from that and, and pursuing my own career my own past because it is very freeing to be able to do and say mm -hmm. I, 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 I wouldn't say i can do and say as i please i don't think anyone can <laughs> but you can get you can do be more expressive i think as a solo person than you can as part of a corporate definitely um, that's why i love people like elon musk i was watching him on an interview yeah. last night um about his you know people were saying well what you know why are you saying this on twitter why are you saying that he's like i would rather lose all my money and still be able to say what the fuck I want to say yeah, than, than, than gather loads of, of dollar and, and have to sit here and watch my P's, watch my Q's, can't yeah. say this, can't say that. Yeah. I thought, yeah, I respect that. Oh, totally. He calls out everyone, doesn't he? Everyone him. that needs he's, to be called he's out. He's proper disrupting. Yeah. He's proper, uh, he's making some noise. He's the modern day Martin Luther King, isn't he really? You know, kind of, you he's know. brave. He's, yeah, he's speaking out for, for, for everyone that's, you know, trapped in this freaking fantasy, crazy, matrix system that you know that we're in so um it's amazingly that you say like you don't do politics i've never voted i've never done politics but i think lockdown was the first time that made me realize that politics does affect us mm, all mm -hmm. so i'm like I'm all of a sudden i've started to have a bit of an interest in it yeah as much as i despise it mm -hmm. and like the politicians there's, n there's no one really stand out for me that i look at and go i like so it's quite interesting how i can see now how politics does affect every single one of us Definitely. So it would be nice maybe one day to have a little bit of an influence in, in that. Yeah. I don't know how we do that as decent people. 
Well, it's hard, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I heard that, like, even to become a politician, once you've qualified, you still have to be elected in. So it's not a guarantee that you're straight from, like, university, doing your degrees, and then become a fully qualified politician. Your party, then, has to all agree to elect you in, which tells me that they're w wondering what your agenda is, interviewing you, to see if you're going to be a cat amongst the pigeons or if you're going to conform within their political movements. Mm. So, um, so yeah, how do you beat that system? <laughs> I don't know is the answer. Yeah. And I know setting up another party would be extremely yeah. difficult. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, you're right. And th let's face it, there's, what, two parties? Um, maybe Lib Dems, maybe three. So yeah. the fact that you've got to get elected by one of them. The problem yeah. is if you, if you say things that um, don't fit a narrative, you, you're just not looked upon well. Like it's, yeah. If you're disruptive, it's not a good thing. But I think we need some disruptive people Definitely. right now to break the cycle of, of what I believe we're in. It's not yeah. good, man. There's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of things going on. And when you hear Elon Musk saying things like, you know, I mean, I'm, I've been listening to you know some of the smartest people, Sam Harris, Elon Musk. So I like to think that these guys are clued up and they're saying some pretty um, terrifying things about the way we're heading. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think we need some people like an Elon to, to kind of like make some real big noise now. Uh, definitely. I'm so, so glad he, he bought Twitter. Twitter. I mean, yeah, he's definitely. already changed the logo. Yeah. I think it's not even called Twitter anymore. No, it's, it's called X. X. Yeah, it's called X. Yeah, it's meant to be <laughs> like the next WeChat sort of platform, which I didn't know anything about when I looked it up the other day. But I do think that you know, people like himself, Joe Rogan, Russell mm. Brand, you know, Russell you, you've great. got a lot of people out there that's basically making a lot of noise. And um, we need more of that, definitely. Do it's you know much about Sam Harris? No, I don't actually. He's interesting because not many people like him. He's a philosopher and um, yeah, he's awesome. Um, Is he the guy with the glasses? No. No. But he's very I'm much like you should be very careful about giving power to Rogan and Brand because he thinks if you put... So he says, firstly, yeah, we've got a mainstream media that we can't trust. That's mm -hmm. a problem. Yeah. But we can't hand it over to podcasters to be the people who decide what truth is. So yeah. if I start to get listeners onto to, to my podcast, he's saying, well, you've got to be very careful about the information that Alex is putting out. Yeah, because you could have your own agenda. Of course. I think everyone yeah. does have their yeah, own agenda. This is the yeah. issue, right? And their own ideas, their own opinions. and yeah. So it's like, how do you bring the truth to the forefront? Yeah, sure. Which in mainstream isn't done anymore. Mm -hmm. when, I remember when I, like, you used to have faith that if the BBC News told you something, it was legit. Yeah. Now I'm like, I don't know if that's true. Yeah. I don't believe that. Yeah. Even the president or the prime minister, I'm like, yeah. I don't know. Exactly. You, can I really trust these guys? Yeah. Can I really trust these? No. No. <laughs> you know what I mean, and I think back, back years ago, there was a little bit more faith. Not that politicians didn't lie, of course. Yeah. But if, if something was reported... They seem to have ramped up a bit, don't they? I think so. Yeah. I think so. And whether this is just a generational thing where like every guy in his 30s and 40s looks back and goes, yeah, it was better yeah. in my yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I don't know whether it's just that. But um, yeah, it's it's a strange world when you don't know. And this is the danger of AI now. Like You're really, you're really not going to know what is true and what isn't. No. And that that's really troublesome when yeah. you don't know what's fact or fiction. And it always brings me back to really just staying in my own lane. And um, I know that some people will disagree with that because like, well, you know, if, what are you doing for the world, how you serve in the world and so on and so forth. But for me, if my, if my world's not um, functioning correctly, you know, I'm out of alignment, I'm not feeling good about myself, I'm focusing too much on, on all of the problems in the world and not being able to change them, I'm not able to create a better life for myself and my family. So it's the first thing that I, I, I always make sure I take care of is one myself, my vibrational alignment, making sure I'm feeling good, high energy. And I do that through many, many different forms. And then I then try to just be a real good role model for my children and also you know, obviously a good father and a, a good husband. And once those things are ticked off and they're all doing, they're all going well for me, um, that's my happy place and I have focused on things that are going on in the world and I went through you know for years we grew up watching the news um, reading the newspapers 
and things like that. And I felt that it always got me down and made me feel quite negative and quite sort of bad. And even angry at people you're never going to meet and you're never going to change. So um, I'm very conscious about how much time I will now focus on what's going wrong in the world and probably more focus on about what I want to go right in my own world. Will a, will a time come maybe one day when I feel I'm sort of fully detached from the sort of whole system? Because I'm not. I'm not, a, I'm not at where I want to be in my personal journey at the moment to probably want to put is enough energy into what's going on, um, what's wrong with the world, and, and try and make, make it a better place. But I do think one day I will probably want to do something like that, mm. similar to what you're doing now. Yeah, I get you. I'm conflicted. By the way, I think your way is that even if you want to change the mm. world, the only way is the way you've just said mm. to start with the self, right? Because sure. yeah, and that makes sense. So, but a bit like growing the podcast or growing a cleaning company, I, I feel the same about this. So you would start with, with the self. You would then kind of impact my family in a positive yeah. way. Then you've got neighbors either side sure. of you. And may, maybe you can be the guy that makes a small difference in your small community, in your local community. Sure. And, and again, I, and then you keep, if you want to, you keep expanding and expanding and expanding. But I think you get youngsters now, they want to change the entire world, but they're out yeah. of fucking control, man. Yeah. They can't even can control they their can't emotions. Control, yeah, they haven't even got the diet right, you know. Or, yeah, so it's like, yeah. well, hold on, before you try and change, this is why I love Jordan Peterson. He's like, well, yeah, climate change, yeah. okay. But before <laughs> you think about that, get yourself in fucking order yeah and that, that makes total logical sense to totally me. Yeah. so i think that should be every man's project that's why i set up the better man i was like you have to you have to start with you man yeah you have to start with 100%. you don't you there's, there's no cheat code to this well yeah because otherwise how can you I, what i've learned about people wanting to be inspired and and people who gravitate towards inspirational speakers is that they're always looking to see whether that person's credible before they'll follow them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know what I mean? You can't just be like a 20-year-old guy that splurts a lot of stuff out on YouTube, but, yeah, you just live in a total opposite life. Do you know what I mean? To what you're actually talking about. You've got to be consistent. You've got to be dedicated. You've got to be disciplined. You've got to be doing things for the right reasons for everybody, not just for yourself. Before anyone that's got anything about them should really be listening to you know you you can't just like i can't imagine you following somebody that's just like blown off a load of hot air on youtube you'd be like doing some background checks going who is this guy like is he any good what's what's he all about oh actually he's a bit of an idiot so you're definitely right so that, that's kind of how i feel i'm not the i'm not the full rounded person i want to be you know and never will be mm. obviously <laughs> but um in order for me to stand on any kind of platform or try and sort of say to people, this is what we all should be doing, I need to make sure I can be doing it first myself, you know, and make sure I've got everything sewn up. And I haven't. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I agree with you 100% there. And if you haven't, I think it's good to put that on the table. I think one of the reasons why I would never go into politics is because I've got like everybody who's lived a life you've got so much dirt and so yep. much fucking mistakes you've made totally. it's like now you wouldn't want any of that sh shit yeah. dug up but in fact the people who fuck up a lot especially in their younger years and learn how to transform themselves like a jeff thompson yeah they're the people we should be listening to because yeah. i'm like he's not some guy born into luxury and yeah uh, you know he hasn't had it all he's, he's had to live a real difficult life and they're the people that you respect but totally. in politics now we we, we know we want these these Oxford Cambridge guys yeah. that have never done a drug, never done alcohol, never cheated, nev never fucked a prostitute, never <laughs> done anything wrong yeah. so that there's no dirt. And I, I get why you wouldn't want to even touch politics now if you're a guy with history. Yeah. But when I listen to Mike Tyson speak, one of the yeah. nastiest men in the world mm -hmm. now who's transformed into a better person, mm -hmm. I'm like, you're the guy that can help some of our youngsters who are, find themselves in, in difficult circumstances. Totally. And the system let him down, which is why he was that person. Mm. Let's not forget, you know, and that's why a lot of people are like that. You know, look how many people are brought up with hatred and anger mm -hmm. just due to gen generational things that have happened to their families, their loved ones themselves. And then they're a product of society. So, you know, and of course, he was slandered and, you know, he was totally and utterly exploited. And you can see where he had all of that anger, you know. But he has 
come full circle and people seem to leave him alone a little bit now and he is getting a good platform and I really respect what he's been through and who he is as a person. But if you were to listen to about all of the dirt, you know, about him, you start, if you're an idiot, you start labeling him and would never listen to him again. But actually he's a real person that went through some real tough times, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm totally with you. I respect anybody who's come from nothing and built themselves up and made lots of mistakes, but the, deep down inside, they're still good people, but they don't always get it right. No, it's um, a lottery as well, man. Like who you're born to, when you're born, where you're born. Yeah. So like, yeah, of course, I would have been exactly like my Tyson too if I was born in that particular environment. So those particular parents, totally. so I would have been that that nasty guy also. So yeah, I always, I'm always like cautious when people are very critical of others. I'm like, hold on, what about your fucking background? Yeah. What about the things you've done wrong? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? What about all those dirty secrets? So yeah. you got to be careful before you start looking at people and label them and stuff. So i got to say, you're looking great shape, man. Thanks, buddy. Like, really good. <laughs> I thought as soon as I saw you, I was like, this dude fucking trains. You're I've still got a so. few kilo I've got to get off. But, well, um, yeah, yeah, sometimes in endurance, point. those few kilos can hurt you out when you run out of <laughs> a, bit, a bit of steam and stuff. So mm. uh, when we're speaking about guys like Tyson and, and, fight, and Jeff and these guys who are fighters, fighters and stuff how how did your background because you, obviously you, you've mixed in in the fighting game boxing and stuff like when we talk about grit to build businesses and stuff mm -hmm. i hear like a fighter sometimes speak there you know how yeah. you're like you will not be beaten you will find a way yeah and i learned a lot of those lessons through combat like mm -hmm. how, how how do you think your um your training of past and your, your combat experience has impacted the way that you think and the way that you approach life and business Oh, yeah, well, I'd say it's probably had a huge uh, positive effect for the person I am today. I mean, like, uh, sort of going back to, like, when I was probably about six or seven, I had a real weird um, uh, relationship with, like, fear and um, confidence when I was younger. So, like, I remember, like, being young, like, sort of five or six, and kind of being, like, I could fight anybody and I'm tough and I'm strong, even from that age. But I had, I had at the time, I had two older brothers. So it was kind of a bit rough and ready um, living with two older brothers because, you know, the older brothers will beat you up. <laughs> and um, so I had a bit of that going on. Nothing too bad, obviously. We're just like babies, you know. But um, so I always had this fighting mindset, survival mindset. And then I went through a phase of like up to about the age of 11 of, of being bullied and picked on by everyone, what seemed to be like that around my area. You got to the summer holidays, I was always getting picked on. And um, I think the more I thought about it and the more fearful I got about it, the worse it become, which is obviously law of attraction. You know, just before I left the house, I was imagining somebody bullying me and walked out of the house and somebody was there bullying me. And again, I, I woke up one morning and I said, today, I'm not gonna get bullied. Today, I'm gonna go and punch the biggest and hardest person that tries to bully me. And um, happened to be a real good friend of mine, uh, Mark Darcy. But at the time he was always giving me a bit of jip. And um, so I remember walking up to the park and he was like a year older than me, which was a big thing then, you know, cause I was like probably about 11. And I've walked off and I've just punched him straight in the face. <laughs> and he's gone, you little shit. And um, so we've had this sort of little scrap up the park. And he goes, right, Finbar's car park. So we're already fighting in the park, but we decided to walk to another car park to have this fight. And then he's beat me up. Um, but I was proud of myself that I faced my fear. And then that was it. I wasn't scared anymore. And then all I can say then, probably for the next five years, I fought what seemed like every day. I just fought and fought and fought. I loved fighting. I wasn't a bully. It was council state area. There was always somebody. There was always a new kid coming along. So I was just fighting everybody. And um, it got to the point where like the older lads, like a couple of years older than me, would pay me to beat up younger lads that were like annoying them or whatever. So it become a real like part of my life where I was just fighting all the time and I just love fighting. I remember like there was like 11 kids that were like a year younger than me 
and they're always like taunting me and different things. And I said, I'll fight all of you. And I remember all 11 of them jumping on top of me to fight me. And they were like beating the shit out of me, kicking the crap out of me. But I remember getting out of that pile and ended up beating up a few of them and the rest of them ran away. And I was like, I can do anything. You know, I was kind of like, had this sort of Superman-like mental attitude of like, I can fight anyone and, and everyone. So that just was like that right through to sort of like my 20s where, you know, I was the type of guy if I was down the town and you looked at me the wrong way. Like, I wasn't a bully, but if I knew there was danger there, I wouldn't half a second and I was punching someone's lights out. I just didn't even think about it. And just did that for such a long time. And I remember getting to the stage of like thinking, I don't think I'm ever going to live past 25 the way I'm going. And there was a lot of um, hairy moments getting involved in that kind of life because all you're thinking about is fighting. So, um, and then I was also, I started boxing, training at Coventry Boys Club, I think when I was about nine. Spent a little bit of time training there. And then I didn't do any boxing then properly until I went to the Mercy Sporting Club till I was about 14, 15. And yeah, ended up boxing for Mercia for about, on and off for about 10 years, I think. And I then just ended up just living a normal life, really. I ended up meeting Paula, and but I was still always a bit punchy for quite some time. And I just always had this sort of like raw anger, raw aggression, real volatile um, temper. If somebody really like engaged with me for combat, I was vile. Like you wouldn't even like the person you probably talk to now, just like if you see me then days, you'd be like, who's that person? Like I was vile, like, I could be real vile. And, um, and that's quite scary because of how many of how many different people I've probably been from that age of six right through to even now, how I've changed so much, but could easily switch back to that person if somebody was like gonna confront me or thought I was in danger or my family was in danger. That little warrior is always there. Um, times that got me into trouble, I ended up almost going to prison uh, a couple of times due to being violent. So that was a real scary time to the point where like my wife had to write a um, statement about me and uh, the judge said, had your wife not wrote this statement, I would have no hesitation but to give you five years in prison. So it was like I went through some sort of rough times with fighting and I always felt incredibly guilty after I beat somebody up. Um, it's a really strange thing because at the time, all I'm thinking about is taking a head off. Like literally like nothing else is in my head but I would just get this guy out. And then afterwards I'll have this overwhelming feel of guilt. And it just ate me for days. So it's like I shouldn't be doing it. So that sort of um, was with me for, you know, best part of probably 25 years really and then a friend of mine really good friend of mine Chris Duffy uh, who sadly died day after my 30th birthday and he was only I think 24 at the time he, he had a terrible accident on a construction site and um, and again I was in trouble with the police or potentially yeah I was in trouble with the police and potentially could be getting into a lot of trouble and I remember uh, at his funeral, I had this boxing glove ring and it was given to me by Joe Montague, who was a professional boxing coach, who I did a bit of training with Joe. And um, so this beautiful boxing glove ring worth a lot of money. Anyway, so I had this and it had two dents in it, teeth dents in it, where I thought that much, I'd actually dented the ring. And I remember when Chris had died and I was at his wake, I, he loved that boxing glove ring. I put it on his finger and I said to him, that's for you, mate. I said, I'm never going to fight again. So I'll give him that ring. And then since then, I've never been in any real trouble. 
Uh, I just made that decision. I didn't want to go back to that life. It was bad energy, you know, and it's conditional thinking. Um, ego was big in our house, you know. If you were hard and you were a fighter, then you were you were great, all that sort of thing. So I had a lot of negatives, but it also gave me a lot of balls and a lot of like, well, I ain't going to be told no. I can do this if I need to do it. So it gave me like a lot of tenacity, a lot of mental strength, that sort of inner warrior through for business and and personal circumstances that I've been through that have been challenging it's helped me so it's a bit yin and yang really um but I'm happier now I don't carry that mindset around with me frees up my mind good energy's flowing all of the time not thinking about you know it's, you get nervous like your adrenaline's flying around your body when you know you're going to be engaging into a fight two or three days before you're worried about it you know it all builds up it's horrible and that's no good so i'm glad all of that kind of stuff's gone um, and so i've kind of sort of kept hold of that fighting spirit but i now use it for better purposes yeah it's a spirit for sure how old are you now are you? i'm 47 look so obviously when you do reflecting now do, do you know why why you were so angry from the age of 16 to 30 when you were uh, you know getting involved in all these st fights do you know what that was um i think because i when i got bullied i felt like i got treated so badly and then i had this attitude of don't you ever treat me like that no one will ever treat me like that and then there's a lot of videos out there that talk to you like crap and think they can just overpower you what I've noticed about people, a lot of people, is they try and steal your energy. They try and get you to do things that they want you to do for their own personal agendas. And for some reason, I detested that. So when somebody was like goading me or trying to get me to do something I didn't want to do or just generally just being a bit demeaning towards me, I'd seen it as like probably when I was a kid being bullied and going, I'm going to knock the fuck out of you and I'm going to put you in your place. And so I think probably the early days of just being bullied, I was kind of red alert. I was on it, like somebody was to say something or try and get me to, to, to you know, to, to take my energy away and try and disempower me. I think that just made me see red straight away. Um, and it still would to this day, you know, I'm very cautious of people, you know, people have their own agendas, but like we talk about with, you know, general sort of media, and people in general, they all have their own agendas. Everybody's looking to get something from somebody for, for whatever reason. And and that's fine. But I'm also like to live and let live. And I don't like people trying to take my energy and steal my energy and trying to get me to do things that they want to do for their own little agendas. And I'm going to come off worse from that. I take great offense to that. Um, but I wouldn't go around punching people for it now. I just avoid people like that. So, um, but I think back in the day, there was a lot of ego as well, you know, because they say you, I grew up in a council estate environment. It was always about fighting, taking Where the was it? Uh, Freeman Street, I used to live, which was just off Stone Stanton Road. So, oh, yeah. Fosal area. Um, and God, you know, like you'd walk out your house on a Monday morning. And the glue sniffers were always in our entry across the road from the house. And you're watching them sniffing glue, watching them inject. You're watching them just do all these crazy stuff. And we were in and around that, like from young kids. So you're just conditioned to hostile environments. So, and I don't know why, and I don't know. I, I never thought about the after effects of like hitting somebody. It was just like survival. I'm gonna hit you before you hit me. And that was what I would do. And then I'd worry about it afterwards. But then equally, I'd always justify it by saying, well, he was gonna hit me, so I've just got there first. Mm -hmm. So um, I can't really sort of pinpoint why I was like that. But um, yeah, not proud of some of it. Um, needed to do some of it, probably. Could have done it better, definitely done things better but you know it's again like we go back to it's like we all learn through life we we make mistakes 
some things were right, some things were wrong. But I know deep down inside, I've always had a really big heart, and I've always had, um, you know, a, a love for 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 the world and for my children, and want to always do the right thing. But you don't always get it right. So this is how I view mentors now. I'm like, who would I rather have teach the younger generation? Someone like you who can explain all the, of this stuff, you know, and why violence, why it might be, uh, you know, uh, hiding an underlying fear that you've got. Um, or somebody wearing a suit that's never had a scrap in their life yeah. who's trying to talk to kids that are born in rough areas of Coventry that are never going to fucking listen to them. Yeah. So it's interesting. I know two of the Ryan men. One is my good friend Mike, who, used to, who is an uh, ex-alcoholic. Mm -hmm. The other guy that I know is an uh, ex-gambling addict. So it's, it interests me. Mm -hmm. D do you find that you do the Iron Man because it, it takes so much energy and effort that it can almost, one, keep you out of trouble, but if you're a guy who's got a lot of that energy inside them, do you find it a really useful outlet where you can channel that, that warrior spirit, that fighter that you've got now, and, and you can put it into what our looks on the internet said so it's the, the toughest, pretty much one of the toughest challenges you can take part in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, what I've what I've found about myself is the most depressed I've ever been, or whenever I feel down, is when I'm unfit um, and slightly overweight. So by default, I think one of my sole purposes of being on this planet was to stay fit and healthy. And um, and if I wasn't, I've always been in doing some kind of training. And even so, when I had my Cajun company, it was very difficult to train at the time because although I managed to do two Ironman whilst I had my catering company, I was doing 60 hours a week and I still managed to train to do an Ironman. And that was very, very, very challenging. But I knew my soul was yearning for me to keep fit. So I think at default, my, my factory settings are, is to stay fit. I always remember when I boxed, training three times a week wasn't enough. I cycled five days a week to work. So I did 16 miles a day and then I'd train three days a week, and then I would do MMA on a Saturday. And I just used to feel this euphoric feeling of staying fit and, and, and alive. So once I started to get a bit, I don't know, a, a friend of mine taught me into doing the Ironman. He did a couple, and he said, you'd be good at doing those, and blah, blah. I was doing a bit of PT, and he was my PT. I said, oh, no, I can never do that, I can never do that. But then he worked on me over a period of time and he's like, yeah, give it a go. So anyway, I did my first sprint and then a year later I did my, th my first Ironman. And I, if I could bottle that feeling and sell it, oh my God. Then you'd be a multi-millionaire. Yeah, <laughs> be a billionaire. Because yeah. that euphoric feeling, I think I carried it around for about three weeks and I was like, wow, I am on cloud nine. So I train now to feel good and it's definitely my mental health release like if I'm feeling down I'm one training session away from feeling good mm. so um, so I don't want to feel depressed so by not training it makes me feel depressed so if I train I know I'm doing the right thing because I feel good so that's why I do what I do it is an extreme sport but when I look back at my background of training like I say, mediocre. It wasn't even mediocre. Three t times a week, boxing is hard work, but it didn't feel enough for me. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel, feel like I'm built more for endurance and um, pushing my body to extreme limits. And I genuinely love what I do. So I haven't got to, you know when I say I have that burning desire to start and stop stuff? I've not got that burning desire to stop. I've got that burning desire to continue. And the plan is to do 10 Ironmen. And then once I've finished the 10, I shall see then how I feel. At the moment, that's the goal. But, um, yeah, it's hard to, hard to know why I'm doing what I'm doing. But all I can say is I'm really enjoying what I'm doing. And I really, I mean, when I first started doing the Ironman, I couldn't swim, couldn't front crawl. I could breaststroke, that was it. Um, I did a bit of cycling when I was younger, but nothing like endurance cycling. And I never really did much running apart from when I was boxing. And um, when I look at how I was then four, 
four and a half years ago to how I am now, my body is coping really well with the extreme training and I'm probably training two to three times a day, seven days a week now. And I'm recovering really well. Like I had a race on Sunday, uh, 70.3, which is a half Ironman distance. And the Monday morning, I was ready to go again, back swimming. That was a PB. You, need to, a P- you need to update your IG profile. I know. It says here, it says your best uh, 70.3 yeah. is 507. It's yeah. not, it's 459. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so I thought I'd point that out. Thank you, mate. Yes, you're pretty that's... good at it as well. Clearly, like yeah. you've got uh, a P, again, I think this is the latest stats. You've got a Ironman finisher four times. Yeah. Uh, PB 10.45. That's right. Copenhagen, that was. Yeah, yeah. you've now got the sub five hours, 70.3 yeah. by six seconds. I love that. You've got a marathon PB of 3.09. You've got a half marathon of one hour 27. This one's disgusting. A 10 kilometer <laughs> PB of 39.07. And that's a bloody tough course, by the way. That's a hilly course. Which one was that? The, the, uh, the, the, called the Northbrook 10K. Oh, okay. So it ran Orsley. So, um, well, oh yeah, my God, it's lumpy. Hilly. So yeah. well, I think I would be quicker that for this flat one. <laughs> it's sure. And then you've got a 5K PB of 18.59. Yeah, I so. think I'd be quick on that now as well. But I haven't done a, a, a flat 5K for a while, so I might try yeah. and beat it. But yeah. They are interesting people, Iron Man, because like yeah. you say, it's um, logically, it's insane to think what you're doing mm. is painful and it's hours and hours of dedication but from what i know the inner self loves dedication and discipline mm-hmm. like you never feel prouder about yourself than when you're that guy who yeah. trains two or three times a day how do you train two or three times a day <laughs> man seven days a week uh, one what do you do and then t- like two like how do how how do you like recover from that and like yeah what, what do, well firstly yeah tell me what you do two three times yes a day. so like um so after my year out i decided i need to get a coach because I'm the type, I'm very motivated and very like, like you've seen with my businesses, once I get an idea, I'll just go for it and nothing can stop me. I thought I was like that with, with training, but actually when I took that year out, I just got really lazy and I wasn't doing a great deal. I was like, shit, I need to get a coach. So anyway, I researched all of the different coach, triathlon coaches um, across the UK. I come, come across a guy called Chris Hines, who's got pure performance. Mm-hmm. And he's got some seriously good athletes and, you know, he's, he's one of the top triathlete trainers out there in the UK. So I've been working with Chris now for two and a half years. And um, when I got to him, you know, I wasn't that in great shape and he had to work with me slowly and steadily to get me to where I am now. It didn't happen overnight, but the body's so remarkable. It recovers so well. Of course, you've got to get everything else right. I mean, I am a bit boring these days in terms of how I live. Like, I'm in bed by 10 o'clock, Monday to Sunday. I'm up at 6 a.m., Monday to Sunday. 10 o'clock, dude, that's wild. I'm in bed by fucking 9. Right. Well, there you go, yeah? So, but how good do you feel? Do you know what? <clears throat> sleep isn't the number one. I need sleep. Mm-hmm. But what I do in my day is a, is a more contributing factor to my energy. If I'm doing tasks like this now, for example, mm-hmm. it's like about 10 Red Bulls, right? I'm wired. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if I was sitting on my laptop sending emails, I'd probably be near nodding off. Yeah. Get so you. I'm more of an environment yeah. person. I need Same. to be around it. Same. And uh, this is what I struggled with lockdown, by the way. And then, then just working on my own online, I'm like, mm-hmm. I miss being around fucking competitive guys like yeah. yourself. I always have this dream and ambition. And again, here's my failure as an entrepreneur. If I notice something that I say like this, yeah. I would love to work with like 10 people that brought absolute fucking energy. Yeah. Even if they were doing their own business thing, yeah. but we went, right, lads, girls, whatever, 50 minutes, we're going to graft on this this project. Yeah. You do your project, I'll do mine. And then for 10 minutes, we're going to bump out some push-ups, do yeah. some sit-ups, yeah. grab a coffee, get back to work. Yeah. That would fucking light me up. Yeah. Doesn't that sound great? Wait, what? do you know what? A friend of mine, uh, going off topic slightly cool, we'll come back to it. he he um, created this model where people like yourself and people at work in like on, at a desk all of the time he had something like um, five minute workout mm-hmm. at your desk so where there was this app and he's at a certain time every day or ten minutes whatever it was they would the app would start and they would get up and they would do push ups 
they would do star jumps, they'd do this, that, and the other. And they'd sit back down at the desk and carry on working. <laughs> I love it already. He sold it. He, he was selling it to the NHS. The NHS was buying it for thousands of their employees. Mm. It was going It was going massive. I don't know how well he's done since, but they were. Like, he had these books and stuff that he was selling with it. Yeah, great idea. So, like, people need that, definitely. I've got two lads that are willing to do a bit of work with me, but we will go and work in Pret in town. <coughs> yeah. So, like, fucking smashing out post ups in Pret. Yeah. I don't know how that will go down. Yeah. Let's find out. Yeah. People will either love it or I'll get, get out of this. Yeah, get yeah, out get, this, get, get out, out yeah, right now, yeah, you yeah. lunatics. But I, I love that but idea. That's a similar thing, then, you know? And, you know, like, if you can get that app to go global mm -hmm. and you start sending it, producing you know, timings and, and, and leaderboards and things like that and getting people involved and saying, right then, 12, it's 12 o'clock, everybody, go, mm. wherever you are. And people are just like throwing out these moves. <laughs> It'd be it's amazing. gamification. People love gamification. It's a little yeah. bit like the Iron Man. Like you, yeah. literally, you know how you have all your stats, and it's the game to try yeah. and better yourself. Of course, it is. Everyone wants to be at the top of the leaderboard. Yeah, I everyone like wants to be at the top of the leaderboard. So, yeah. and and everyone wants to feel good. So yeah. it's a win-win. Well, there you go, mate. There might be a gap in the market. Yeah, that. yeah. But yeah, I always, I always <laughs> sit and wish that I had that. So I'm like, Alex, just fucking create it then. Yeah, exactly. You but, know, there's yeah. a great idea, and that opens it to everybody. Uh -huh. You're not just the workplace. Like Daniel was doing like the workplace, but you're opening that out to everyone. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Get that get that app out yeah. there. That's get why I can't done. work here, man. Like there's a guy upstairs, <laughs> by the way, he's a lovely guy, but he sits there with this baguette, right? Like just white bread, nothing yeah. in it. Just a whole oh, baguette shit. chomping away, right? Yeah. It's about five stone overweight. And the energy is like, I'm like, yeah. Do you know what? I would get everyone off their ass now. Yeah. Everyone would be doing 50 push-ups. It'd be nuts. And the thing is, he would go, I'm not doing that. Yeah. But if you had 10 people in the office doing it, he would do it. Oh, it's environment. So I think we talk about life lessons. Number one for me, you've got, you've got, and we talked about energy earlier, plugging into the right energy outlets. Definitely. Other people, uh, some people will take, some people will give. Yeah. But like even meditation, if I do it in a group environment, man, I can meditate well on my own. Mm. I don't really get much. Mm. Energy is, is yeah. already like just being around you. I'm yeah. like, let's go and train, man. Totally. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, it ha it's infectious, it's, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, without it, I feel it like I've got goose, goosebumps and my hair on the back of my neck standing up because it's that, you feel the connection. Yeah. And I, and again, like going back to when I used to employ people, do you know over a 20 year period of employing people, do you know how many people that I met that was like myself that had just a good, positive mental attitude, high energy? I'm gonna list, oh well. We're talking of, uh, let's say, let's say a thousand people, but there's probably more than that. Well, this is might be a bit of a trick question because I think you would hire those people, but you might say actually hardly any. One. Right. <laughs> I met one person. There you go. Her name was Anna, and she was brilliant, and she she was just the, the biggest thing for me was negativity. Uh -huh. The rest of them people had a negative mindset. They would come in and they would find problems literally in almost everything they did. They might start off good for a week or two weeks or a month and then all of a sudden you start to see their world falling apart and whatever dramas are going on in their lives. And I'm not knocking these people, but I'm just trying to say I find it very difficult working with people and employing people because of that negative energy that they brought and I, there was the biggest thing I would say to people, don't bring your negative energy into my workplace. Mm -hmm. Keep it away. You bring that shit into my workplace, you won't work here. Simple as that. And I had to make people really mindful of that. But equally, they couldn't help it. It's how they were conditioned and how they used to think. So I used to find that really challenging. It's probably why I'm in such a good place now because I don't rely on anybody anymore. You know, it's kind of just me and my own thoughts. And that's not always going to stay the same because of the way I'm going to be going with my business. I will need to rely on people again. But it won't no, won't be nothing like it used to be. But, um, but energy uh, is definitely, definitely important. People's energy is really important because um, it, it can bring you down. And I'm a positive person. And I know I always look at the glass half full you stick me with somebody for a week who's negative and just grating on me and just, you know what I mean, chipping away at you. In the end, I'm like, I turn into that person that I used to be and I'm just like, I don't want to punch your face in. Get out of my business. It's mm. like, I get really like down and angry because I'm like, you brought me down to this level. And 
some people will argue and say, well, it's your own fault for bringing yourself down to that level, but no, it's my own fault for having you around me. I don't want to be around that, that type of person. And um, that's, that's what I've learned. Yeah, I don't care who you are. You will eventually be a, a product of the environment. I don't care how, sh- yeah. you know, if you're continuously hearing those messages coming from people that are not yeah. good mm-hmm. and they're going in and they're going in and they're going in, eventually they're going to have some, it's, it's a bit like saying I can keep eating shit food, but I'm going to keep in great shape yeah. and, and feel, no, eventually that shit food will, will get to you and stuff. Do you have to be quite disciplined in, in all areas of your life now with what you do? So from alcohol to nutrition? Sure, yeah. So the one thing I haven't got sewn up is my nutrition um in terms of drinking i rarely drink um certainly don't drink in the week weekends a couple of units here and there uh, i still like to live a bit but um sleep i've got really nailed but um diet has always been a tricky one and it's it is one thing that most people struggle with still to this day even people that are doing really well just to give you an example bumped into a guy yesterday at the gym I was doing a weight session with uh, somebody. And um, this guy, I didn't know him, but he's speaking to, you know, Rich Levy? Yeah. Yeah. So he's with Rich. And the, the Rich got chatting to this guy and he said, how are you doing? Oh, not so good. And this guy looked physically strong, right? Looked really good. And uh, he goes, oh, not, not good. I've, I've had a, a test the other day. He goes, basically, at work, he goes, and I've had this random sort of like health test and my blood pressure is sky high. And said, you need to get down to the doctors and see what's going on. So he went down to the doctors and um, his blood pressure, sky high. He's almost got liver failure, pre-diabetic. This guy's like 35, 36. And um, risk of a heart attack um, and risk of liver failure. And Rich is like that. Ah. And I go to the guy, how good, you, how good or bad your diet? He went, awful. But I thought because I'm going to the gym, I was all right. I was like, shit. So um, so my diet is great in terms of what I eat. Like I don't eat like, let's say great. It's like 80% decent, but there's a few extra kilos sat on my body because of I probably have a little bit too much sugar or a bit too much carbs at time and stuff like that. But I've got it pretty well sewn up, but I'm not racing at race weight at the moment. So I'm sort of going to look to go back towards the ketogenic diet where... Um, I did that four years ago when I did my Brazil race, uh, Ironman Brazil, and it was the best I ever felt, best shape I was ever in, most clearest I ever f- thought. You know, I just had this like n- no brain fog. Oh, wow. that's interesting, isn't it? Because you, you would assume the opposite, right? Oh. You think endurance athletes, carbs, 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 yeah, carbs. Yeah, totally. So like when I told Chris, so for example, for that race, I finished that race at 11 hours 10. I woke up in the morning I'd had a ham and cheese roll and I put one in my back pocket for the bike and I just had electrolytes in my drink and I finished that race in 11 hours 10. I had nothing else. My body just served me through the fats and protein that my body had had inside. I did carb up the day before, I had a few carbs, but even Chris was like, that's incredible. So we've taught to have carbs and carbs and carbs and sugary stuff. But actually, it doesn't always serve your body mm. that well. So um, I'm going to go back towards probably 80% fats, protein, and 20% carbs and just see how that works for me. Yeah, I get you. And it's one of those things, isn't it? The more you have, the kind of you get into this, the, this cycle, the more you want. It's really, mm-hmm. really simple. So yeah. like when you don't have those foods for, for a while, you don't actually crave them that much. It's, That's it's right. When, it's when you're consuming them. I'm still a bit of a glutton, man. Like I'm a disciplined guy, but... Well, I think I'm disciplined, but the way I deal with it is I just, like, especially in the week, I just don't eat crap. Because mm-hmm. if I yeah. have a little bit, I'm like a fucking drug addict. I'm like, oh, right, yeah. give me some more, give exactly. me some more. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm much rather have zero than than none. But then yeah. on a Saturday, for example, I will what, eat whatever the hell I yeah, want yeah. on a Saturday night, you know, Get if I want to have pizza and beers. Totally. I will. So it's like an 80, same thing, like an 80, 20, 90, yeah. 10 kind of rule. Um, the hard thing is not to be a pig in that those four hours of eating what you want sometimes i can just overeat That's and it's it. just Same. not enjoyable anymore it's just yeah. stupid in fact it's just gluttony yeah. so there's a, a kind of like a lack of discipline there um, yeah. but i like the way i feel the next day i know it sounds weird but I, I look a bit bigger i feel a bit better and then that seems to just fuel me for a week and then psychologically i'm like well if there's anything i crave i know i can have it at some point yeah i think when you say i'm never going to have anything again exactly you want it. 
Yeah. Whereas I'll just go, well, do you know what? I want that pizza. I'll tell you what, I'll have, I'll have it on Saturday. It's just all about balance, isn't it, really? In I moderation. think so. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. But Iron Man, <clears throat> entrepreneurs, balance, mm, not very good at it. Yeah. So, yeah, it is about balance. It's also not. It's, do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? It's like there's nothing balanced about being an Iron Man. You have to be a bit fucking nuts. Do you yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> so it's kind of like, yeah, yeah it's, it's it balanced in certain areas, yeah, but in, in some areas in life, being balanced gets you pretty moderate results. Mm. Like you're an all in kind of guy, right? Yeah. That's what you do. I'd say so. Yeah. And I think it's good to stop fighting that. I think sometimes I've spent so many years trying to change who I am. Mm. And like, yeah, I'm a passionate all in kind of person too. And me aiming for moderation sometimes actually takes the the pleasure and fun out of who I am. Yeah. So I might as well just go, you know what? Yeah, I am. But what I will go all in on is something healthy and productive exactly. and beneficial to the world yeah. versus all in on this computer game. Exactly. You know I mean, one, one serves, one doesn't. Definitely. A hundred percent. Because there's nothing like in Paula says, my wife, Paula, she'll say to me, like, you know, you're addicted to what you do. I say, I am. I says, but it's a good addiction, you know? So I think I'm fine with that. Yeah. But I remember Paula buying me for my, 30th birthday or whatever I was working loads and never had much time she bought me a PlayStation biggest mistake she ever made <laughs> and I remember on a Saturday and a Sunday getting up at 10am on a Saturday putting on the PlayStation and still on it at 10 o'clock that night no way and I remember hating myself yeah because internally my internal dialogue was going what are you doing yeah. you could be doing this you could be doing that you could be doing that and that went on for some months but I just ignored it and I just carried on playing this PlayStation. And then I was like, get rid of this PlayStation. It didn't work well. It didn't work for me. So I would much rather be doing what I'm doing now, putting all of my energy into things that I really love. I get to travel with what I'm doing. So mm-hmm. I'm traveling all over the world. Yeah, great point. Yeah, I'm meeting some lovely people. Mm-hmm. I'm inspiring my children. I'm inspiring other people, I think, you know. Some people I'm probably annoying the shit out of. I don't care. But it's like, it's serving a purpose for not just me, but I think for, certainly for my children. I know that my boys look at what I'm doing and go, I've always taught them about mindset and set, you know, and whenever they start to moan about they're tired or whatever, I'm like, mm, see what I did today, boys. And not in a way to make them try and, well, you know, big me up, but it's like, you can do anything, mm. you know? But you show them, don't you? You don't yeah. just tell them. There's you a difference. You show them, exactly. You show them. There's so many people out there that tell, tell the yeah. kids about how to eat well, tell the kids about how That's to train. How. I'm like, hold on, just yeah. show them. Yeah. They're watching. They're watching everything you, they're watching everything you do, man. I Definitely. think, I think people, I think everyone's addicted to something. Yeah. Even if people don't think they're addicted, like have a look at your habits and routines, whether mm-hmm. they're healthy or not, you've got some. Yeah. You've got some patterns in your life. Of course. Yeah. And it just depends where you want to channel them. You've got to tell me what you do two or three times a day. You haven't told me yet. Oh, yeah. So That's um, where we were at before we got yeah. started. This is what I do, mate. This is <laughs> what I do. <laughs> Sorry, but... No, no, it's me. <laughs> when you say, how can you grow a podcast, you can go, Alex, keep on fucking track. You go No, left, no, right, no, it's fine. Place. I think it's great because, you know, like things are just coming in and it, yeah. I think the energy is just flowing. It's like... Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm are coming. Busy now. Yeah, it's brilliant. So, um, so like today, for example, I swam this morning. Uh, it was about two and a half thousand meters. Today, I'm just doing an hour run, which is just a moderate run, which is about six and a half miles. I can hate people like you, mate. I'm going to go. You know, I'm just doing a quick, quick um, swim. This I'll do a quick six miles yeah. this afternoon. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's a light day. Yesterday, I did um, an hour and a half on the bike. I did. Um, an hour strength and conditioning session and then did an hour striking right. session. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, so you got five disciplines in there, basically. You've got your run, swim, cycle, strength, and then your combat. Yeah, combat. Yeah. I st- I've, so I've been doing that. Cl- well, I've been going to that class for 17 years now. It's John Anderson. Oh, so you go to that one, do you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Striking Does Matty still do it? Well, Matty's back now for a little bit. He's uh, going again. Yeah. So he, he was back um, two weeks ago. So he, him guy. and John started the class. And... Um, but Matty's been travelling a lot, as you know, uh, yeah, recently. Do, yeah, so yeah. he's back again for another week or so, and then he's going again. So he's loving life. And um, so I help out at the class when Matty's not there. So um, I sort of stand in for Matty. But that's a great class. And I like to keep my hand in. Uh-huh. Again, that little warrior thing where I can just feel that I'm still useful if I ever need to be with yeah. punching the pads and a switched on with uh, combat. Yeah. And there's no sparring there, is there? No sparring. No. It's just hitting pads. But it's like street life, self-defense type stuff. So it's all from John Anderson's teachings. Great class. 
So every Tuesday at 6pm, where the Spiritual Warrior. So get yourself up there, Alex. I, mean, I miss striking yeah. so much. I miss combat. I was doing BJJ. <clears throat> But my, this is why I'm fascinated about how you stay uh, injury free. Because mm. I did BJJ for a while. I was fucking well, destroyed. Well, BJJ is one of them sports where potentially you can get injured quite easily. But e- equally, so you can you can also in triathlons because what I've found about the triathlon world is there's like one percent that does everything right, and then the rest then sort of just fumble their way through. Mm-hmm. And some will do it to you know to the best of ability obviously but what's really important for triathlon training and any kind of training is flexibility and strength and conditioning to keep your muscles f- from injury prevention strength and conditioning was never part of my plan when mm. i first started doing um these triathlons then i got a glute injury which put me out for like 18 months i couldn't run it was terrible. It was after Brazil. I just tore like my glute from doing these crazy sprints. So I learned a lot then about how important it was to one be stretching, going to see a sports massage, um, get a sports massage regular, see a physiotherapist, re- sports physio regular, and doing regular strength and conditioning. So I've ha- I have to now incorporate strength and conditioning twice a week into my training regime. I have to, I do one active stretching session a week, but I stretch after every impactual training session I do. And then consistency with a swim, bike, run, three swims, three bikes, three runs a week minimum. And over a seven day period, it just took me two and a half years to get to that. But what your body loves is that consistency. And then it recovers really well. It knows what it's doing. It's not like train for a week, do nothing for a week, train for a week. So that's really puts your body into good stead. But you've definitely got to be looking at flexibility and strength and conditioning when you're doing any kind of sort of extreme training because you are prone to injuries otherwise. Yeah. And um, really sort of uh, dialing on the weak areas of your body that are going to be under stress. Yeah, I get you. Yeah. All, the, all the stuff, yeah, the flexibility <coughs> stuff is something I just, I'm terrible at. I just get so bored. Do you do you always start your day with movement? Because I was, again, what, uh, I'm fascinated by morning routines. Mm-hmm. So are you a guy that likes to get up and, and do something active to, to get that day started off on a positive way? Or are you one that likes to sit and reflect and be still? Or do you just get up and just, just get on with life? Yeah, so like every morning, as I say, I'm up quite early. Because I'm in, at home now, I work from home. So, um that was a challenge yeah, working from sure, home yeah. you know, after you know over 20 25 years of working at a premise different kind of sort of premises um but anyway so i have a great routine in the morning i'll go and put the washing on you know uh take stuff out of the dryer empty the dishwashers tidy around the house do all these little things that's like a usually a 45 minute sort of job for me sit and have a coffee and then I will catch up on sort of emails and general tasks to do. And my plan, my um, plan is written out for me sort of usually like a week in advance. So I'll know what's coming up. So then like some of the some of the training sessions, like some of the bike sessions and the interval running sessions are really mentally draining and really tough. And um, sometimes you just don't feel up for it Mm -hmm. and um it takes all of your willpower and all of your mental determination to do those sessions and then there's times i can get up and i'm like thanks mate like i'm firing through the day i'm like i'm ticking off those three sessions bang 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 no problem and i don't even know why some days i feel up for it and some days i don't because i try to live pretty consistent but sometimes my energy will be a bit higher and a bit lower so, um, but I try to keep my routine the same every day. So I think it was years of having my catering company, 17 years of working a certain way. Everything was done very precise, very specifically. And you know what catering's like, you know, you've got to be on it. Mm-hmm. So I was very disciplined. And again, being a chef all them years, I like a routine. So once I get all those things ticked off in the morning, I'm then ready to start my training and then First session might be a bike or it might be a swim and then it will be a run later or whatever. So I'm mentally prepared and I always look at my plan every day, but 
start of the week and then every day just to get myself mentally prepared for it because I know what's coming. So roughly what time are you trained? So um, morning, afternoon, evening, what times? Uh, so like on a Wednesday and a Friday, I swim at Stony Cove. So I'll be there for 8.30 in the morning, finish usually about 10 a.m., come home, probably have a bit of breakfast. Then I would then go out for my run and then depending what else I've got on then, there'll be another session later on in the evening. So that's kind of sort of how I do it. Um, oh, proper full time athlete then. Yeah. I will care for what you asked for with the universe yeah. because it's exactly what I asked for and it's exactly it's amazing, what I've got. Though. I mean, um, I, I, you know, I could sit here and say, oh, for fucking hell, I wouldn't have time for that. But deep down within myself, I know that I still waste time each yeah. and every day. Mm-hmm. Last night was a <laughs> shit example, well, a great example, but a <laughs> shit one where I was just like, it's just too much picking up the phone needlessly. Yeah. Yeah. Know, just things where you're like, you could do something much better. Yeah. And I have some therapists on here that go, well, you know, you've got to have some compassion for yourself. And, yeah. and I get that. But I think it's within, it's innate within some of us. We don't want to waste time. Yeah. We, we'd, or at least not on stupid fucking things. Yeah. There's chilling and then there's wasting time. They're very different, aren't yeah. they? And I think that's your internal soul telling you that you've got so much more that you can be doing and need to be doing. I love that, mate. And um, yeah. it's pulling at you. Yeah. And I've always, whenever I've felt, again, I've always acted on the you know, energy of like, I need to do this, I'm doing it now. It feels right. I've aligned, I'm aligned with the stars. It's like I've been thinking about an idea and I've got this burning desire, I'm going to go and do it. And sometimes you might not quite be there. Do you know what I mean? You're the, the right idea isn't quite there because for me, it's always been a real godly pull to go and do something. It's not like just half-heartedly finding an idea and just fumbling the way through it. I've always had this burning pull to do it, which I know is right. Where is it? Is it, is it in your mind? Is it in your heart? It's in my is heart. it right it's here? Right here, right in my heart. And it's like. And is it a voice? Is it something that's. Set, or is just it just a pull? It's, it's just weird, a pull. Isn't it? What yes, is that? I don't know. But it's like. What is that? Is that do you believe in this higher power that's saying, so, Lee, like, fucking open your eyes, totally, you've got to go here? Totally. Yeah, totally. Without oh. a doubt. <laughs> and I've ignored it a lot of times. And I've been the most unhappiest when I've ignored mm. it. You know, so. I'm guilty of doing exactly what you say sometimes. And I've sat there, like playing on the PlayStation, ignoring it, you know, doing my own head in, pissing myself off, going, what am I doing? I'm wasting ability, I'm wasting ideas, I'm wasting all this stuff. But but then also, um, once you find that idea, I think you know, and you just ride with it. It's probably like when you set up this podcast. I bet that was a, like a high energy moment when you probably set it up. Sure. But you know what stops me often, and, and again, whether it's an excuse or whether there's like just tools and resources to get past it, is energy. Mm. Like sometimes, like after you know, by five pm, I'm done. Mm-hmm. So there's things that I'd like to do. Yeah. And because I'm so tired, I end up pissing it away, and I'm mm. like, I, yeah, I don't know whether just jumping in the cold shower at that point. Yeah. I'm still learning how to structure my day. Yeah. Because I, I often blow my load in the first four hours <laughs> of the day. You know, like the, the best of Alex has happened yeah. by, in, by lunchtime. So I think some of it is just strategy of like, yeah, you know, do you need to put your foot on the gas and then maybe chill for a few hours, yeah. but properly, you know, maybe a nap, cold shot, and then go again. Yeah. Um, but it's just working out how to get the best out of you. It's like coaching yourself and parenting yourself, yeah. isn't it? Well, it's hard, isn't it? Because when you work for yourself, it's great. Yeah. But also you're going to be so self-disciplined. Big time. And um, Big time, mate. Yeah. You, got, you know, it's really hard to, to do that. And I remember when I first had my catering company, I wasn't that busy. And I felt that I wasn't really pushing for much business. And I got really lazy. I was like, right, what do I do to keep myself busy? I was like, I make, because I didn't have any clients. I I didn't have anyone to answer to. I can earn that little bit of money and I'm happy. And I kind of got into that kind of relaxed sort of way of like running a business. Oh, I'm I'm earning all right. I'm, I'm all right. But it weren't all right because I wasn't happy. I felt like I was being lazy. So I decided then to get loads of clients and they were then my boss. I was like, now my clients are my boss. So that means I now have to serve them to make sure I'm keeping them happy, which is now going to keep me motivated and switched on. So I found a way to keep myself motivated um, because it's really hard when you're self-employed to just get up and go, I'm going to do this because who are you doing it for? You're doing it for yourself. And it's like, so you've almost got to give yourself a boss of somebody that's sort of watching over you, even a mentor and, and, and answering to somebody. 
and striving to be like that next person because then that then means that you've got some kind of accountability somebody's watching over you did you do this why didn't you do that so i think being a self-employed is great but i also think you've got to have somebody telling you behind you and nitpicking at you going what are you doing have you done that why didn't you do that you should be doing that do you know what i mean couldn't that, agree more that might actually just push you on that little bit further absolutely and and it has for sure it's worth <laughs> a treat and my business is built on accountability it's so important but it's interesting when we think we're tired sometimes we're bored sometimes we're not pushed enough mm. isn't it amazing like some guys will sit there and you know i'm too tired so it will be film it'll be playstation mm -hmm. and again these things take energy Whereas yeah. often, I think if you sat there bored, yawning, you're probably just not, there's not enough for you to do. Yeah. So I reckon, you know, I, I need to look at my own self here before I start dishing out advice. But yeah, may, maybe I need to ask more of myself because I can kick back in the evening. I'm single. Yeah. I work for myself. Yeah. I can put my feet on my nose. Living the dream. Me. Living the dream. Living the dream. But, but actually, like you say, that's fine unless your soul's saying otherwise. You know, then soul, you've got That's conflict. what you've got to listen to because yeah. if you've got conflicts going on, then you know there's something stirring away going, mm. No, Alex, you need to be doing this. And I've had it a million times, you know, and it's like, no, Lee, something's not right. And I'm like, I, I talk to myself, I'm like, I know, I know, I'm going to sort it, I know. And then you go through that pain and then afterwards you go, right, okay, I need to deal with this. You know, it's, yeah. Mate, I could speak to you all day, man. <laughs> um, dude, I've got to ask this question before we wrap up. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a classic one. What, what are you, what do you need to work on next in order for you to become what you would consider like a better man? Lose anger. Definitely, it's my first go-to if things are not going right. It's like a default within me and it definitely halts my energy and puts it in a reverse motion if I'm not careful. You mean like it's like a reaction? Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. like the first thing I think about thing. if somebody's like pissing me off, I'm thinking about punching their face in <laughs> and that's like really bad. So, um, so I'm so, so not over that, that cycle of my life. Um, so to lose that kind of, yeah, aggressive sort of angry sort of. How'd you do that? Well, I've been, I've been exploring the options, the ideas of the ayahuasca treatments and the mushrooms, just to sort of open up the soul, open up to the soul a bit more uh -huh. and see if there's any sort of trauma there that I can perhaps maybe try and get rid of and see if that might help. Um, obviously spoke to Matty a lot about things like that and did a lot of research on that. Because I think, you know, we've got the physical aspect of us, but then I think you do have like, um, obviously you've got the soul side, which we don't nowhere near tap into enough. And um, I think you've got to be entwined with both of those physically and spiritually. And I would say I'm probably physically in control of myself, but there's something still there where it's triggering off these little sort of like angry spots within me. And uh, so, yeah, I think I'd probably look at the spiritual route just to see if there's anything there that can be done to try and sort of get okay. rid of some of that. Is there any fear, and maybe this might even show up subconsciously, that you would lose your edge, that you would lose that drive, that warrior in you, that <laughs> stubborn guy who's gonna cross the line at the Iron Man, or do you see them as completely unrelated? No. I. Th no, I definitely don't worry about that in terms of like my passion for what I'm doing now. Um, and even the warrior side of it, I mean, I haven't been in the fight for probably best part of 10, 15 years, something like that maybe. So I'm certainly not thinking or wanting to be in any kind of fighting. So I'm not even worried about losing that either. I, all I know is, is that when something gets under my skin, it takes all of my thoughts in a negative way, lives in my head too long. My energy is going, you know, to places where it shouldn't be. It's all negative energy. It doesn't serve me and it doesn't mm. serve it. It doesn't serve anyone else or in the house either. You know, it's that energy you're bringing. So I'm like, I don't need it. I just want it gone. So, um, yeah, I totally get that. Yeah. Mate. The, I, I get the consumption. There's a woman in my life that just stole every thought that I've ever had. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it, isn't yeah. it? You feel so powerless. Yeah. You kind of know that you have got more power over it than yeah. that. But I know totally. what you mean when someone consumes you. Can you can chew it, on it for days and weeks. Weeks, months. Yeah, exactly. And even worse, mate, years and lifetimes. Yeah. People chew on shit for lifetimes. Exactly. And, and the longer you focus your energy on that, the bigger it becomes, the more it consumes you. I've had a couple of little things recently and they're really trivial to most people. It's really sort of, I've been chewing on it and I'm like, I know all of the rules of getting rid of that and not even focusing on that. 
but I've still, I've still been chewing on it. So it happens, you know, and it's like, and it could be a part of my old ego mm -hmm. kicking in and going, yeah, all right, Lee, you know, calm down. You know, you're not freaking 20 anymore and you don't need to be going around doing that, but it's still there. Do you know what I mean? There's part of that ego still there and, oh, who does he think he is? Because, you know, I could do this and probably couldn't. Do you know what I mean? I'd probably get my face punched in, but it's like, it's still there. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So I, I just want to get rid of that side of me. I don't think it serves me anymore. Cool, mate. Listen, you're going to have to come back on in six months' time to let us know how you've got on with this journey. But, uh, Thanks, mate. Mate, I'm going to keep an eye on what you're doing. I love what you do. Uh, mm -hmm. I really enjoyed that chat. I could go on for yeah, an hour really easily. Good. Really and good. if you see me in Pret or some, some time, bumping out some push ups. <laughs> we'll do some like push ups, mate. I'll yeah. join in with you. Mate, thank you. Thank you so that much. It was an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Uh, you're a good man. Thank Cheers, you. Cheers, mate. mate.